Welcome to our Bridging Voices CAS video podcast. I have two lovely persons here sitting with me today, two great guests. One will today represent, let's say, Global South and one a Global North perspective. And we will try to have a nice dialogue about just transition, being more focused on energy transition and also on the role of startups in such a transition. And we will try to find a way where bottom-up and top-down actions towards climate change might meet. And this will be our last section about Green Deal strategy, because there is in the center just transition mentioned. And we will try to understand what that just transition actually means for Global South as well as for Global North. And yes, my name is Karin and I work for Konrad Adenauer Stiftung here in Brussels office. And my focus is exactly on climate and energy. So, Anja, please, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, uh, Karen, very much. My name is Anja Boretta. I'm head of the regional program Energy, Security and Climate Change in Sub-Saharan Africa for Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, and we are based in Nairobi. Oh, thank you. And Christian, could you also briefly introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, I'm a married uh, father of two wonderful children and... Um, I professionally started as a researcher in biomedical research, had many roles in many industries, um, from consulting to senior management to leadership, and um, now I'm working as advisor and consultant and co-founder and lead founder to usually technology startups in the earliest phases um, of their existence. And I have to say you are actually today here because of participating in a conference focused on uh, energy and energy transition as well. Uh, could you just briefly describe uh, why you are so much interested in this topic, why you are here today, and what do you expect from this conference as an outcome? Um, sure. So, I mean, we, we as CAS office in Nairobi, we obviously do work very close uh, closely with other CAS offices around the world, and Brussels being, being one of them. Um, because I think when we talk about energy and climate, um, it's a global issue that needs to be resolved together. And one of the priorities of my program um, is to actually try to bridge the um, knowledge, let's say, between African countries and Europe, particularly Germany, of course, but also really to enable to learn from each other. Um, because there are a lot of concepts that are perceived in a very different way and that obviously might need or might lead to, to misunderstanding sometimes. So I think it's very important that we really understand what the other side is talking about, what are the needs, um, where are they up to when we need when we try to resolve the you know the global energy um, situation together or you know change the or increase the awareness for, for climate and, and what needs to happen. So I'm always happy, grateful if there's a, um, the possibility, you know, to, to learn and get a bit more of a deep dive into the European discussion because as I'm based in Nairobi, I, I usually follow very closely the African discussions, but from time to time it's important to also get this deep dive in, in European discussions. Thank you, Anya. And Christian, what, what do you expect from this conference? Why are we here? What are the key takeaways you are expecting? Yeah. Uh, I love to take time off for more general perspectives on life and uh, society, um, which I actually um, learned to value as a scholar of the Adenauer Stiftung when I still wanted to be a researcher in the biomedical field and improve um, the lives of uh, um, people suffering from diseases. Um, so th this is something... Um, the Adenauer um, Stiftung has contributed to my life and energy is, in my view, the key factor for civilization and I had um, an interest in energy efficiency um, already as a pupil and it was another um, field of study that I had investigated but um, I then um, had different roles where I was focused on just financial aspects, doing mergers and acquisitions and strategy um, in the energy industry. And this is really a recalibration now. Um, I'm working with startups 
And very often I'm working on startups just for the sake of making money with these startups in order to be able to invest this money in transitioning the um, real estate um, sector in Germany but bottom up as an investor. So this is um, a subject from my heart, but I'm also involved in startups um, that had tried to tackle um, the transition of the energy industry, for example, in blockchain-based insurtech that wanted to um, introduce insurances that um, help the adoption of um, use of electric cars and um, <laughs> private people producing um, power. Interesting. So yes, let's talk about startups. Uh, I would go a bit ground lower. Let's try to answer the question what actually a green startup mean. Uh, we're talking about startups. Um, we hear more and more about sustainability. Someone calls it green startup, someone sustainable startup. So could you maybe just a bit explain to, to the audience uh, what, what we mean with, with a green startup? Um, I mean, from, from my perspective, and I'm happy that there's an expert who might correct me after, I would probably prefer the you know, the terminology of green startup, because sustainable at the end of the day means that it's it can be sustainable from a lot of point of views. It can also be economically sustainable, mm. but then it doesn't necessarily mean that it's green. So from a green startup, I would probably define it as, an, as a business that is in the very early steps of its operational business. I don't know if there's a time frame, but, you know, at the, at the beginning, let's say. And it has an idea that evolves around how to address climate change. Um, or how to, to find solutions to increase the use of renewable energy, for instance. Um, yeah, and, and you know, when it comes to climate change, obviously that could be adaptation or mitigation. So adaptation to climate change, um, you know, how you can make your environment more resilient, mm -hmm. and mitigation, obviously, how can you decrease um, fossil fuel emissions mm -hmm. and, you know, give power to more renewable solutions. That's my take on the definition but happy so you to see yours. <laughs> so you see as the initial idea which should like be the driver of creating a startup is saying how can i tackle also the climate change so there should be like this climate uh thing behind me deciding to create whatever startup and come with my idea i should look at it from the perspective what for impact it does have for for the climate this can be one angle and then the other one could be yeah, how can I really, um, not, it's not about tackling the climate change, but maybe to understand how can I uh, disrupt the system which is now in place, for example, as we see the energy system, saying let's go for some innovative solution and in invest in really like a research and development to really come with a totally new thing, new solution. So not just to say, okay, I will now create an app for reducing a waste, but this is the one way we can go with startups. And the other one could be, yeah, but let's come with something totally new and innovative and break through. Um, yeah, so this is just reflecting that I, I actually am also align uh, with, with your idea about what a green startup means. But yeah, what, what Christian, are you also with us on board? <laughs> um, Do you have a different uh, view? Um, generally, I'm um, aligned, but um, maybe I go back to um, my two de general definitions of green startups. So one I see is a startup that thrives to be as resource and energy efficient as possible as an organization and obviously as long as this is uh, still cost efficient and this definition can be applied to any startup irrespective of the industry or market um, or whatever differentiators applied for defining this um, startup but these startups obviously can also produce goods that are not more sustainable or more climate friendly than other products but at least there is a saving. Mm -hmm. So this is the internal green startup. And the second definition that I see this is a startup that focuses on making the way we produce and consume goods and services as resource efficient as possible and then also less climate and environmentally harming as possible. And again, it has to be achieved with... Um, so, um, 
a cost base that is still economically viable. And uh, strictly speaking, these startups could be internally not very resource efficient, but they will have the scaling effect with the products and services and the impact they have on the lives. So it's a bit counterintuitive um, to discern these two uh, dimensions, but I think these are both right. For example, some services just require a certain amount of energy mm. and resource use. But if at least the operation that provides these services is green, then um, there's also a positive impact. But uh, I agree that the general um, accepted, um, generally accepted definition of a green startup is a startup that deals with making our life more resource efficient and less harmful for the environment. So being green also inside the own startups, so yeah. people working there and all the products and services should always be uh, in line with trying to really yeah. use as, as few energy as possible. Uh, and, and this also has a scaling effect mm -hmm. if the uh, employees get used to this and tell about this. But this is more a grassroots thing. Yeah. But it can um, be done with economically very viable startups that do um, normal business. Uh, Anya, from uh, Africa, not like say from Global South perspective, where you see a real need in which sector or area to focus on investing and only supporting startups? Where you see their like role? Is there any specific sector where you see it's really necessary for Africa to develop, to invest in innovative ideas and solutions? Um, yes, definitely. Uh, I, I think one sector that clearly stands out is the so-called climate smart agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and that might sound a bit strange for from the Global North perspective, but you see around 60 to 65% of um, the GDP created in African countries does still come from agriculture, meaning mm -hmm. that most of the people work in agriculture. And if you see you know, the global food crisis malnourishment, that is clearly something that needs to be addressed because mm -hmm. agriculture will be there and will, will remain also in the future. But the terminology climate smart agriculture means that it's an agriculture that greening the agriculture uh, in itself, mm -hmm. so it uses, um, it uses less resources, for example, not so much of the um, ordinary um, fertilizers, you know, um, and at the same time becomes resilient to um, to climate uh, change uh, events. And it doesn't sound very exciting, probably mm. it's not uh, rocket science, but it's something that definitely needs to be addressed. Mm. And we, we did a lot of work with um, young entrepreneurs that work in climate uh, smart agriculture in the past, and they also say that one of the challenges they have that One of them actually said, so I'm quoting, <laughs> it's not very sexy. Mm. A lot of young people in rural areas in Africa want to go to the big cities, they want to work in IT, um, they, they don't really want to work in agriculture, but it is absolutely needed. And mm. so the question is, how can we make this business more sexy, more attractive? Mm. Um, and that is obviously using some level of, of technology um, and at the same time making it more resilient to climate change. Um, and also making it, of course, more efficient, that you get more out of it, because it's not a problem in African countries. The output in the Afri in agriculture is not very high. Yeah? So that, that means, basically, if you look at um, the output you get per hectare square of crops, it's much um, mm. lower than in industrialized countries. Um, so, yeah, that is one area that, that definitely um, needs to be looked into. And a lot of things have been have been done. I mean, for example, I came across a young startup some years ago that developed drone technology um, for agriculture. So the drone basically delivers pictures that um, can measure the level of droughtness of the field. So the farmer knows exactly where he should use water uh, and where he shouldn't. And that obviously saves water mm. um, and, and is very helpful and can, you know... Uh, increase the, the level of, of productivity. So these are very small examples. Um, they're probably not revolutionary, but nevertheless, they're, they're very much needed. Mm. 
And Cass, in Africa, you alone, um, you also work with startups, right? You you create some programs and mm-hmm. also kind of capacity building activities. Could you just briefly talk about what what Cass plays uh, for a role in in this? Uh? So, so I think when you look at you know probably the you know the conditions for startups in in Africa compared to Europe, is it di- more difficult? Is it easier? Um, I would say to some extent it's easier, and that's probably also a philosophical question. So the lack of regulations, the lack of mm-hmm. frameworks can to some extent be helpful um, to just try out something new, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and don't don't kill the idea at the beginning by, I don't know, <laughs> by 500 pages of regulation. Yeah? Um, for, for instance, we, you know, in, in Kenya where, where we are based, there, there's a lot in this moment... Um, talking about how to do how to apply circular economy models and there's this guy and he basically um, yeah he I don't know if you say like sm- he smelters plastics mm-hmm. so he, he, he heats them to very high degrees so they become liquid and then he, he builds um, you know m- material uh, you know bricks for houses uh, you know to kind of reuse the, the plastic I don't think that would be possible in, in Europe without, I don't know how many ISO standards and how many rules and regulations. Um, so, so this lack of absence can also be an inspiration of, um, of creativity. Of course, a lot of the problems that you have are coming from the absence of framework and institutions. So it's a two, two-folded mm-hmm. coin, I would say. Um, one of the main challenges that those startups have is, you know, that there are no facilities as we might have in Europe that support startups, especially from the financial point of view. Mm. It's incredibly hard for them sometimes to get a license, especially if the idea is new and has not been heard of. Some startups reported that sometimes they have to, if they want to rent, I don't know, a uh, you know, fabric or something, they sometimes need to pay upfront the rent for two years. Who has that money uh, if, if you just mm. started the company? So I think that is one of the challenges, that they're not really programs that support also financially startups, um, you know, any tax regulations that say, you know, if you are in the green area, in the clean area, um, you don't need to pay income taxes for one year or so. Obviously, you also have to obviously take into consideration that the fiscal space is very limited in African countries. Mm. Um, but what we did with startups was to to help them develop, developing, and we work a lot with startups in the climate smart agriculture, to really develop them, to help develop their business plans. Mm-hmm. Um, we are not in the position to say you should do this or that, because we don't have the creativity, and I think it needs to really come from the people that are facing situations everyday life. So a lot of those startups are not um, professional, you know, startup, it, they're not in the startup community. Sometimes, you know, they're farmers, they see a problem, a challenge and they want to address it or this this guy that I, I previously mentioned who invented invented the drone technology or you know applied in this local community he was a computer engineer so he's neither a farmer nor does he have the business know-how and a lot of people think okay this is a great idea and we're going to implement it but they never have learned that they need a business plan that they need to think uh, who is their market uh, sector mm. Who are they going to expand the business? And they don't know technical things, financial aspects. They don't really know that. So we try to provide that um, by working together with, with experts that are helping startups, kind of incubators. I mean, we can always do that on, only on a very s- small scale. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when I speak to this young startups and also to, to professionals that uh, help to support startups in Africa, they say this valley of death after the idea, and then is the idea really going to expand? Is it to thrive? The business is very, very high because mm-hmm. people just come there and don't have any idea how they want to do it. They just have a great idea, but there's no there's lack of experience, lack of knowledge, and then the idea dies, unfortunately, at a very early stage of the startup. And this is something that we are that we're trying to address. And also, um, I mean, being a regional program, obviously, one of the advantages is that we can facilitate and support peer-to-peer learning. Mm-hmm. So the last event that we that we had, um, we had startups, young startups from the from the agricultural sector from over 20 countries. And one of the results was afterwards that they actually 
connected to each other and you know helped each other out kind of did mentoring some of them expanded their little markets to the neighboring countries because they finally had a sparing partner in the other countries mm -hmm. um, because it is also something that we forget you know Africa uh, the regional integration in Africa is very low so it's not, you know, you drive, you take a train and you drive from one country to another. You very often have not heard uh, what is going on in your neighboring country. Mm. If you have some level of education, you've probably been to Europe. But, you know, if you are in Burkina Faso, chances are very high. You've never been to Senegal, you've never been to Mali. Um, and, and that is obviously something that we can, we can address, this peer-to-peer -peer learning within the, the African region. So they are the ones who say what to do and you help them to provide the tools how to do that and maybe make it sustainable that, it, as you said, don't end in a death valley. <laughs> okay, thank you, Anya. And uh, back to you, Christian. Um, where you see the interest of private investors? Uh, in which sector, startup sector, they are now investing in Germany? What is the fancy startup to create now? Where, what should I focus on where, where the money flows then? <laughs> Um, generally, the situation um, has become more difficult with the higher interest rates. So many sources of funding are not as available as before. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a very good uh, situation for founders that actually want to build a sustainable business. You said this um, in the non-climate uh, sense, and this is very healthy. There used to be startups that just got the millions um, and millions after millions in order to grow something big and they didn't look at um, profits. So I think now it is um, one thing that you have to execute better. Not fast, like in the past, but in a sustainable way that you um, prepare your product, internal structures, um, in more efficient and cost-effective ways. So this is the general setting. In terms of industries, there's uh, very often um, some topics that are, I call it now, hot shit, where investors start uh, throwing money at because it's a race to get in um, the market leadership position. Because very often... Um, the goal of um, venture capitalists, i.e. professional investors that give money for young startups, uh, want to create market leaders because the market leaders dominate and will have uh, very high profits over a longer period of time. Hence, the return they make on their investment is just the highest. So there was um, a race in Europe, for example, and also in the US with self-driving cars um, at that was hot shit or with instant delivery of goods and service uh, of, of goods so um, not very viable businesses requiring a lot of capital um, at the moment I'm not very sure whether I I know the one area I would focus on and I would rather say that the general principles of good um, startup founding like you have a good team that executes well, that you've got um, a good financing partner that um, helps you also through um, some financially difficult um, phases is more important um, than um, trying to work on the hot shit. Oh, interesting word. <laughs> <laughs> Mentioned several times, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm... As I'm working also for CAS Multinational Development Policy Dialogue Program, we always try to find the bridges between Global North and Global South. And already from what you said, we feel there are like differences, especially gaps in speak about developed countries, developing countries. So they are really trying to develop something for facing their challenges they, they have in, in place, but still we see they are lacking the capacity building, the tools, and of course the main tool is, is money, right, and funding to, to scale up. Um, and here, of course, we always hear and also heard today from our Indian colleagues who spoke about, give us your money and we will deliver. But at the same time, and you also said, uh, and the others saying, okay, let's let the challenge owner be the local people, the people coming from the region where they face those challenges, 
And of course, we need to provide them the tools. I said that the Global North German investor can listen to and say, yeah, you convinced me with your business model because they live in their bubbles, in their north view, and they expect maybe the expectations coming from people in abroad are similar they expect from people from the global uh, uh, south. So uh, just uh, what is your view, Anya? C- could you see that there is like a potential future collaboration between north investors and south uh, thinkers and startups? And uh, as you said, like what for incentives uh, you see Global North could be interested in why why I should go and put my money on on a, on a startup in a in a farming uh, country like uh, you, you mentioned. I mean, there's a, another discussion that can you know go on forever mm. between startups and financiers. The startups are saying there's not enough money, and the financiers saying they're not enough good ideas. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I'm not in a position to say, is the money really there? Um, are people a bit, uh, you know, skeptic to invest? I mean, clearly, and, and we don't even, it's not only for startups, but we see that in general, um, especially Europe, uh, especially Germany in Europe, um, you know, industries are very skeptic to invest in Africa, um, which to some extent I understand, you know, mm. it seems a very far away continent, even though it isn't, it's only six hours flight. Um, people don't really know what is going on in the local country. So I think the, the most important thing is not to generalize. Africa consists of 54 states. And you cannot compare South Africa with Kenya. You cannot compare Kenya with Mali. You cannot compare Mali with Senegal. And that is the first you know, thing or observation that is super important. Um, and, and I think in the last years we have seen a general trend of Uh, investors that are trying to get, I don't know if you want to call it a greener portfolio, but investing more shares in, um, you know, climate smart solutions, which are the investors are also asking for. And I think there's a general will to to invest in in solutions that are not only economically viable, but also ecologically viable and social viable. So I think, you know, there is the... There's the demand and there's the supply, but then we have kind of a, a gap or a box in the middle, mm-hmm. which means very often, as I said, you know, these ideas are not very well executed. You, you're presented with a business plan that you don't really know, that it's not logic, that you don't know where the things are coming from. Um, so and that, that is exactly what we're trying. We, we've tried to close this gap. So I, I think there are great ideas in Africa. And Africa is a very young country, very dynamic, very, very innovative. Um, but very often it's, you know this bridge that is missing, you know, the lack of information, the lack of access. But I think we have also seen in the past, once there's a good idea, um, you know, everyone wants to wants to be on board because we all know that the climate change causes a lot of challenges for African countries. And when there is a viable solution that also, you know, can, can bring you money, people are very interested. Mm-hmm. There is obviously nothing wrong in making money. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, as I said, this, bridge or gap that, that somehow needs to be filled, be it with information, be it with capacity building. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I personally don't think money is the issue when it comes to startups. I mean, I'm not talking about now, you know, climate investment uh, full in and, you know, the billions that will be needed. I'm, I'm really talking about the startup sector. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think there is a lot of potential, but I mean, how, how to bridge, how, how to fill the, the gap, I, it, it's a challenge, yeah. I would underline the importance of capacity building. I always see that um, working also a bit with startups in my previous work uh, under EIT Climate Kick and trying to build these ecosystems in especially Central Eastern Europe, I could see how big uh, benefit is to create this kind of programs uh, full of peer-to-peer learning, uh, connecting the people, learning from each other, understand how to build a business uh, what tools I need, even the basic thing, how to present my business model in an understandable way, convincing way, you know, have those jury like trial trial uh, presentations that they can train themselves how to how to sell the idea and it helped them also to build up and, and build partnerships and, and feel a bit not alone, like feeling the confidence of 
understanding that there are others who want to go the same way. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely could underline the importance of networking, having this kind of trial events, educa educative events, where they can really, you know, try how to, how to attract and understand their own business and business model better and improve. Um, question, I have another country because time, uh, another question because time is running. Um, um, yeah, what, what do you see as a potential uh, for you, for international collaboration? Would you be personally interested in investing into a startup uh, abroad? And I said, what actually actually would be the the points, the incentives you would like to hear from a startup to convince you to invest in? Yeah. Um, first of all, um, I think I have some. Um, maybe it's a personal blend, but I've got some different semantics when I talk about um, startup businesses. Because my view of a startup is a company or a team that wants to found a company that will scale and will scale fast and will scale big. This is startup and founders. And um, my impression is, from what I learned uh, now um, from the programs that you support, it is more about entrepreneurship and giving people um, opportunities to build businesses. So this is maybe um, a matter of perspective that is different. Plus, with the professional investors, they have high internal cost with all the lawyers and all these people that have um, six-digit and seven-digit salary um, checks a year and want incentive for good investments. Hence, they need to invest in something where their hours spent will create a lot of money for the investor. So the traditional venture capital investor is only looking at high returns and um, larger so-called tickets, investments, in order to get high returns and even more money back. So with these um, more local, smaller uh, entrepreneurial startups, um, it is a matter of finding different uh, ways of funding. And um, there is um, impact investors. This is a different kind of investor because these are people who don't care primarily about the returns. Also, these impact companies have different cost structures and very often they get their funds from um, different sources that are not looking at the two-digit um, return, mm -hmm. but that are also happy with the one-digit return and doing something good while creating returns. So um, th this is um, some scene setting I'm doing now. Um, when it comes to investments in Africa, I know that, for example, Rocket Internet, the um, company builder by the Samba brothers who uh, founded um, the precursor of eBay, Alando Beck, uh, in the 1990s, they have invested uh, also in Africa with business models um, that work, for example, in the West. But also their approach is obviously have a team with few people and scale it fast. So um, to have the impact on society, it is probably the impact investor and state money and crowd financing and other initiatives that will um, provide the funds. But the classic venture capitalist um, the Y Combinators, uh, Andresen Horowitzes uh, of this uh, of the world um, would probably um, not invest in a small farmer. Even though I know, for example, your example with the drones is very attractive for the impact and would be a scalable business. I also know another business, also with drones, where they deliver um, blood samples and uh, medicine. This is absolutely high tech. They have a catapult, and um, this is actually an American startup that operates in Africa. But again, this is high tech. This was expensive, but this is also a locally driven initiative. But um, generally speaking, I think um, there's some um, way to go in order to really collaborate. I personally see a lot of potential in Africa, also because um, of the lack of legacy. You mentioned the lack of regulation. Um, I would add legacy because um, 
they have different infrastructure. For example, very often um, in African, country, African countries, there is no infrastructure that is expensive to maintain. So they are mobile first and also they will um, start maybe with decentralized energy because there's a lot of sun, so you can harvest the uh, temperature and you can also harvest um, the radiation and produce um, electricity. So you have got power and you've got um, temperature which you can use in a decentral way. And this is a chance that is probably uh, an opportunity that is probably completely overlooked. At least I haven't seen it in the bubbles I'm following. And there's many examples where the specifics of the um, African continent um, will provide to making our lives better. Impact investors is precisely what Africa needs. Because if you see the, the business cases or, you know, the, the money that is needed, it's, you know, compared to um, what normally venture capital spends, it's so small. Uh, we're talking probably sometimes $10,000, $50,000. And that's a general problem when we talk about climate finance, that mm -hmm. very often the, the money needed for to find uh, a solution for a local problem is so low People cannot even apply for grant because it starts with millions. Yeah, mm. that's also a problem for the for the Green Climate Fund. Um, but but that is precisely, and I understand. I mean, we all know that at the end of the day, if you if you treat a proposal or you know have a, a startup on the table that is, is, is pitching for ten million or ten thousand, the work is the same. So you know, if you have an idea of fifty thousand, you say, should I really you know uh, take the time to go through this and really because it's, it's so little money and obviously the, the return is so low, so it doesn't really make sense. But, but I, I would really wish that this um, segment of, of impact investment grows in the future or probably you know, this idea of um, philanthropic money, because I think very often that is where the impact investment is coming from, will grow or that you know, venture capital firms say, okay, we're dedicating now 5% of our revenues to purely impact investment, where we probably also have kind of a component, you know, we hire people that go there and offer services for free um, to those startups, because it's really local problems that mm. need local solutions sometimes. And, and I think what, I mean, the, the drone technology is one thing, but another example to, you know, to really demonstrate how, um, how little investment you need is, is another startup, I think from Nigeria, it's called Rent a Tractor. So rent a tractor basically operates on the idea that farmers don't have the technology, um, you know, to to harvest, uh, to grow the seeds. But of course, they cannot afford a tractor, so they can rent it by hour, yeah, for very little money, um, and that's the business model. Mm -hmm. But of course, the startup needs to buy two or three tractors in the first place, which in African context is is incredibly a lot of money, and they can't afford it. Um, but I mean, grow a tractor or rent a tractor is is getting bigger now, and and you know they, they have, you know, I think overcome this valley of death. So so they are they are operational. Um, but this is just also an idea, or you know, that really demonstrates that the solutions need to come from African countries. Because I doubt that anyone, uh, you know, in Europe would sit. How can we have African, you know, farmers? Ah, let's, you know, they should rent tractors. It's really something that comes from the ground, and I think that's what also is really important to, to stress um, that, that the solution or the idea needs to come from African countries that we can't sit here and, and you know, develop ideas uh, how, we can, how we can support. Uh, I've got one addition um, because of the challenge that taking um, investment analysis to a more cost-efficient way this could be done by artificial intelligence uh, in the future. It could be rule-based. Yeah. You don't need AI for everything. Uh, it's a buzzword, but um, with what I've seen now about the hype chat GPT and uh, all the other um, AI models uh, or large language models um, that are out there, um, I can see that um, there's a different way of interacting which is easier for the people applying so they don't have to fill out a business model canvas and deliver a business plan, but maybe they can even in their local language explain what they're doing 
and then they can uh, artificial intelligence will create a business plan and a business model canvas and then the artificial intelligence can maybe decide or just uh, give the decision document to um, a gatekeeper human investor and this will take out a lot of the um, barriers there are from the um, entrepreneurs and startup founders applying um, from the process and free a lot of capacity um, for small ticket investments. I haven't checked whether this exists, but I think um, it should exist. Interesting. Uh, interesting idea coming up uh, during talking about innovative innovation startups, so innovation within innovation. Uh, thank you. Uh, time is running. Um, let's skip a bit uh, to a bit broader topic. Uh, the conference uh, you are attending and myself as well is focused on Green Deal and energy transition. Uh, be more precise about just energy transition. Uh, I would like maybe, Anya, if you could a bit further elaborate on African perspective on how they see this EU Green Deal and this uh, how they understand this just transition. Uh. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there's really so much discussion about the Green mm. Deal going on. I mean, probably on a very high level. Um, but let's say the ordinary citizen is not, is not aware of that. It's not such a big buzz as it is in Europe. Um, and now the reactions to the Green Deal, I think, are mixed. I think in generally it's, it's welcome that, that Europe uh, is committing to more climate change, but there's also some level of skepticism what it will mean for the African countries. Um, you know, will it uh, will it be beneficial, or you know, will it create another burden for for nascent industries on the continent? And I think that is really something that we have to learn. Um, we have a very European-centered uh, way of, of seeing things. Uh, we need to decarbonize, we need to transform our industries. African countries don't need to decarbonize because there's nothing they can decarbonize. Some of the countries have negative emissions. Mm. If you take South Africa apart, there's basically, you know, with South Africa, I think that African countries are responsible for less than 5% of the global emissions. If you take uh, South Africa out, I don't know how much left two percent so why does the world need to decarbonize um, that's a very legitimate question a lot of african countries are asking if at the same time they don't have any industry to feed the people to give jobs uh, employment opportunities and and we tend to see it from a very european centered way and say of course we need to decarbonize but but how can we find way for African countries to prosper without making the same mistakes than we did. Because very often it's, it's perceived as, you have developed, you're rich, and now you're basically telling us you can't have your piece of the cake. Uh, you need to stay where you are, because if you're emitting more, then you know the world will basically implode. And, and that, is, that is very often the perception. Um, so I think this, this dialogue needs to be more pragmatic. Um, we, as the industrialized countries, have the obligation to decarbonize and, to be quite frankly, do it faster as we are now and not always find excuses why the future doesn't start tomorrow but only in five years um, because this is also perceived very well on the African continent. Um, and, and at the same time, try to find solutions that are viable economically, ecologically and sociable for African countries to grow their industries, but do it in the most um, climate-friendly way possible. And that might not be the net zero way, um, but you know, uh, creating significant less emissions than, than in this moment. And, and I think there's an opportunity, but it's also a danger if, if we don't get that narrative right. And especially, I mean, the Green Deal was one thing, now we have CBAM, um, you know, some African countries are uh, very afraid that they have one or two industries. Um, some countries are, you know, trading with Europe and they have one trading partner, they have one good, and, and they depend so much on that good. And if now you put a, a tariff on that specific good, they're done. Now, we can probably not imagine, because we have normally very diversified portfolios, 
um, when we say we have trading partners. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know within the European Union, but but some of th some of these trading relations that African countries have with one specific country in Europe or with the European Union, they really rely on that, mm. and and they're very afraid that CBAM will create another barrier for them. So we really have to think when you know CBAM will be introduced, how can we address those fears? How can we support African countries in you know, creating systems and, and not making um, the industries that they have, uh, you know, the kind of the scapegoat and, uh, and the disadvantage. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, is, that, is, that is very, very important and, and it needs to happen soon. And, and I hope there will come some, you know, some solutions from the European Union to address these problems soon. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Anja. And I, I would also here underline the importance of always looking in the things from a bit broader perspective and sometimes jump out, out of our bubble, especially the EU Brussels bubble, and understand the impact of what our own EU-centric strategies could have uh, on other countries and find the time to explain, to set a dialogue and discuss and listen to such perspectives from other countries and then maybe reshape the politi policies that it's in a global good way. Um, yeah, so uh, Christian, and to you, um, Green Deal. When I say this word, what, what, what comes up in your mind? What do you see under this kind of uh, term? Do you already see, uh, or is the impact of a Green Deal baked here in the EU already also? Can you feel it in your daily life uh, or in your business life? Uh, as we spoke about uh, green startups, I understand you, you underlined a lot um, the importance of energy efficiency and to make the business really like green. So here I, I see that you already reflect the goals of, of uh, EU countries uh, towards you know sustainable future and green future and energy transition. So you are very much focused on this energy efficiency element or are there other elements from the Green Deal you feel like you, you would like to take with uh, uh, into your own business? I think generally um, the Green Deal is um, a good opportunity to reset to some extent the way how we live, how we do business and how we organize our lives. Um, I know there's a bubble somewhere in the internet uh, that speaks about the Great Reset and that this is um, some plan to, uh, to, to make poor people even poorer and rich people richer, but uh, I think um, there's an opportunity in um, transforming the way we live. And I also see, um, because we're now um, very much focusing on how North and South can um, collaborate in this discussion, that the South can also help um, the North to um, achieve the targets. For example, uh, Paul von Son, who uh, used to have uh, leadership roles in Desertec industrial initiatives, used to be one of the managers I worked for uh, back in the energy industry, was already decades, now we can say decades ago, working on an idea that um, in sub-Saharan Africa, the um, energy of the sun can be harvested and transported into Europe in order to decarbonize. This is obviously um, a capital intensive, not a labor intensive, and more a high-tech project, but still it is an opportunity. And also we spoke today in the conference um, about the plans in Namibia for um, hydrogen uh, production. This is also a big opportunity to actually take the advantages the South has in order to um, ameliorate um, the effects our disadvantages in Europe have, has um, because it was coal um, and still is coal for producing steel. And um, we don't need to talk about the negative effects of firing coal. That's is, is just clear. So I see that um, the Green Deal actually has an effect that is positive not only on Europe, but also on um, other regions of the world. But I also see that there's challenges um, for the people 
um, in Europe that don't understand the implications um, on their lives, that see prices increasing and um, also there's a lot of discussions about um, the way we should transition the energy um, situation. But coming back to startups, this was your initial question, but I think it is important to look at the wider scene before looking at startups um, because there's such a large number of different types of startups and industries. Um, I think um, in the startup uh, landscape, there's opportunities, for example, also in just applying what is there, but applying it uh, there in terms of technologies and ideas and applying it in a more um, useful way. For example, I've heard in a podcast that in Frankfurt, only the excess heat of uh, server farms would allow for 30% of the heat need in the city of Frankfurt. Obviously, you have to collect the energy, uh, the, the heat, and you have to bring the heat to houses, or you can store heat. There's many ways, that there's aquifers and uh, different ways how you can conserve heat and also con uh, transfer heat into electricity and the other way around. And to organize this in an efficient way is a big opportunity for startups because um, everything that speeds the transformation of the energy system is very helpful for the planet. Another example is, um, which is also more about scaling existing technologies, is geothermal energy. Um, there's regions like in Bavaria around the Rhine where you can um, create um, a lot of uh, energy from uh, geothermal power. And I read, I think, in Capital uh, last week that 30% of the German um, heat requirement can actually be catered for with geothermal energy. But we've got um, very little knowledge where to actually drill. We've got very little equipment for drilling, so we need um, good um, algorithms and engineers that identify the good locations and focus on the good locations to drill and use the uh, drilling equipment there in order to speed the transition. So this is um, not the traditional startup opportunity, but there is an opportunity for startups. Thank you, Christian. Time is running. I think we need to end our discussion. We could discuss hours about startups, conditions for startups. And uh, Anya, yes, last word and comments for, from your side. Yes, so just a good, uh, good idea on, on uh, north-south learning. Uh, geothermal energy is already exploited heavily in Kenya. Uh, it makes a lot, it's uh, what, 20, 30 percent of the, of the energy mix. The Kenyan government wants to bring it up to 40 percent in, in 10 years. It's the main uh, source of, of renewable energy in the electricity mix already. Um, and there is actually um, a startup, for instance, that, that one uh, from, from Europe that is going to um, uh, have its production site at a geothermal uh, source because very cheap energy. And it's a carbon capture storage technology they're using. So maybe Germany can learn from Kenya how to, how to exploit geothermal energy better and, and, uh, and that would be a good, good cooperation, I think. Let's set up uh, some online call and a peer-to-peer -peer exchange between uh, Global South and Global North. I'm always in favor. Maybe I will put on a list of our future activities. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, um, we go back to the conference and let's see what, what else the energy experts have to say to us. But I really appreciate it, Anya, you are here today and Christian as well. And that dialogue is here, the Global North and Global South. I always feel there is a need to exchange perspectives. And this is also one of the roles Konrad Arno Stiftung is playing to really bring people together and support them in talking and communicating things together. Thank you very much and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you, Anya. Thank, Thank you, you, Christian. Thanks for having us.